Revelation chapter 6. And we'll start reading with verse 1 and read a few verses. And then I'll bring you the message. And I, uh, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come, hold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went out forth to conquering and to conquer. Now, beloved, this first horse and rider is a picture of the Antichrist riding the horse. Now, somebody said, I believe that's the Lord. No, I know a lot of folks that believe that's Jesus, but it's not. It's the Antichrist that's making a false promise to this world. Now, people are gullible. They'll slaughter anything, and the world's about ready now for the Antichrist. All the Lord has to do is come, and then, brother, the Antichrist will have it. And I've got news for you. He can't have it because I'm leaving out. Glory to God. And we'll have to worry about it. Notice, notice verse 3. The Bible said, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And uh, there went out another horse that was red. Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, beloved, this is war and bloodshed that follows the Antichrist. He gives a false hope and a false peace. Now notice verse 5. And when he opened the third seal, I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, the, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And all power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Now, look at this last one, if you will, please. He has all the power of the other three. And death and hell are in the saddle when, when the fourth seal is broken, and the rider of the fourth horse comes out. But notice, if you will, please, verse 5 and 6 will be the text for the message. And the third seal is open. And he said, I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And behold, I, I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Now, would you notice what he says about that? And I heard a voice. In the midst of the four beasts sake, a measure of wheat for a penny. Now, let me say this, and then I'm going to pray and bring you the message. On when a loaf of bread will cost... Uh, approximately twenty dollars. Now, here's a rider, a third rider that comes out, and the Bible said he's black, tipping of typifying famine. And the Scripture said the rider had a pair of balances in his hand, and a voice was heard in the midst of these beasts, and he said a measure of wheat for a penny. Now, there are three measures in the Bible that are different types. There's one which is about a quart. It's a quart measure. There's another which is about half of that, which is about a pint measure. And then the third measure in the Bible is uh, the smallest container you can find. Somebody likened it unto a grain of mustard seed when Jesus talked about faith. But the last measure he speaks of in the Bible is the one that uh, John is talking about when he said you'll get just a teeny bit of wheat for a penny. And somebody's taken that and multiplied it into a loaf of bread and said it'll cost you over $20 a loaf. And so John said, I saw a third beast come out and said he cried, What? A measure of wheat for a penny or a loaf of bread will cost $20. Now I want you to bow for just a word of prayer. And in just a moment, I'm going to bring you the message on that day, in that day when this will happen. Now, beloved, listen. The Bible speaks and the Bible gives us uh, truth and the Bible gives us the way and the Bible gives us hope in these days even when we find what's going to happen in the days to come and the scripture speaks about this day that'll be upon the earth when the seals will be opened. I'm going to pray in just a moment and then bring you the message. But I want you to pray, beloved. Oh, I tell you, our needs God in America. I believe that in these days that we need a revival. I've said this week several times in this meeting, we must have an old-fashioned revival. Our brother, our nation's gone. We must come back to God. Our, my friends, our homes will be destroyed. We must come back to God. Our beloved will be so confused in days to come, there'll be no victory. But I'm glad that there is a remedy. 
So let us pray, and then I'll bring the message. Father, I want to thank you this afternoon for every blessing we have of this rally service here at Pine Grove. I thank you for the dear humble pastor. I thank you for the choir. I thank you for everyone that's had part in the singing. Now, Lord, as we come to bring the message, we recognize that the Word of God tells us that prophecy is the light that shineth in the dark place. And although we look around, and although we see the darkness of the hour setting around us, thank God, some golden daybreak. Jesus is coming, hallelujah. And when Jesus comes, we know that we'll rejoice in his presence and because we'll be caught up in the air to meet him. So I pray that you'd give us that hope, that blessed hope in our hearts and instill it today until when we leave here we can be able to say praise the Lord. We've been stirred by the word of God and the promises of the Bible and we'll thank you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, beloved, I want to speak to you on the subject when a loaf of bread or in the day of great inflation. Somebody said, preacher, I don't believe that we'll ever see that day. Well, whether you believe it, we may not see it. In fact, I doubt that the church will see it. But I believe we're going to see some hard times. I've heard people say, why, brother, the church is not going through the tribulation. I agree to that. But I believe before Jesus comes, maybe we may see some suffering and some heartache and some trial. Oh, you say, but preacher, God loves us too good. God loved Daniel, but he let him be cast in the den of lions. God loved Paul and Silas, but he let their backs be beaten, and they were cast into a prison. And God loves us, but my friend, there may be a day of suffering ahead of us. But somebody said, preacher, what about inflation? Your dollar will buy less and less in the days to come. The dollar is about shock. And I believe this, my friend, that inflation will rise and rise until the Word of God says a measure of wheat for a pity. Now somebody said, Preacher, what must happen before that day comes? In Second Thessalonians we find three things that must happen before that day comes. And this is just the introduction. Let me give it to you. He said, First, there must be a great falling away. Now whether you realize it or not, beloved, we're in the greatest falling away I've ever seen. Well, there was a time when God's people would come together in victory and shouting praises. And brother, but listen, there's a falling away. Everywhere you look, churches that one time had power with God, they've fallen away. Preachers at one time stood for something, have no convictions anymore. And the Bible speaks of that falling away. It says in Revelation chapter 3 that they'll be poor and miserable and naked in that day spiritually. Talking about the church of the Laodicean age. And so before that day comes, there'll be a fall away. Secondly, he said, before that day comes, the Holy Spirit will be removed. That means that the church will be gone. Now when the tribulation enters, I'll be gone. Somebody said, preacher, are you leaving out? Yes, sir, I've got my ticket. I'm going up on the first load. And praise the Lord, I'll be back after I'm taken up with the Lord. Somebody said, are you coming back? Yes, with 10,000 of his saints. Enoch said the Lord had come. He's talking there of the revelation. But Paul talked about the rapture. And here we find, he said, except the Holy Spirit be removed. Now, I believe the church will be removed before that awful time. This will be the rapture of the church. And I'm glad I believe in it. Old hearts don't used to sing. Some golden neighbor, Jesus will come. I remember 20-something years ago, I saw Brother Aspel for the first time. Uh, or maybe not the first time, but one of the first times. Uh, and as he came and sat in the funeral there, and they sang in that funeral. Uh, at Brother Harold Cyprus, little girl's funeral. Uh, some golden day break, Jesus will come. Uh, I sat there behind that coffin, or in front of that coffin. Uh, my tears streamed down my face uh, as I looked at that man of God uh, and thought about, now it's more real. Uh, he's had it as his theme song. Uh, he's talked about that blessed hope. Uh, my friends, let me say, if you've ever lost a loved one, uh, that's more real to you than anything in this world. Uh, that one morning, Jesus is going to step out on the cloud, uh, and he's going to sound that trumpet, uh, and the dead in Christ are coming out of their graves, uh, and it's going to be a hallelujah time. Uh, 
It's going to be a getting up morning. Oh, you say, do you believe it? I feel a little bit of the power that's going to raise us already. I'm glad, brother, that Jesus is coming. But the Bible speaks of the day of inflation and the day of the worthless dollar. It says in James 5 that the rich men are weak and the well because their garments will be moth eaten and their gold will be kinkered and they'll throw their money in the street. They'll have a handful of money and can't buy a loaf of bread. The Bible said they'll weep and they'll howl. But if you've got Jesus, I want to tell you, and that day does come before the rapture. Bless God, you'll have the living bread which came down from heaven. You'll have a fortification that'll stand in the darkest hour. But I say to you, there will be famines. The Bible said until the coming of the Lord, of the revelation of the Lord, that there will be famines. And on this afternoon rally service, I want to give you some famines that we're going to see. First, there'll be a famine of Bible preaching. I'll tell you, if there's anything we need, it's some old-fashioned Bible preaching. I get so tired of sermonettes for Christianettes smoking cigarettes. Bless God, we need some Bible preaching. We need to hear the saith the Lord. And beloved, listen, old Amos went up and down his countryside in Samaria, and he said, I'm not a prophet. Neither, neither am I the son of a prophet. But he said, there'll come a day, there'll be a famine of the hearing of the word of the Lord. And my friend, listen to me, a church ought not to be known as a church that has a big entertainment program for its children. A church ought not to be known as a singing church. I'll tell you, every church ought to be known as an old-fashioned gospel preaching church where the man of God preaches the word of God. And brother, listen to me, if you've got a pastor that preaches the word, you ought to hug his neck and thank him for being a man of God and take him this book and preach to you the word of God. My old pastor died by 2096. Uh, 95 and 96. I used to go to him, his church, and I was a little boy. He'd get up and take those old sleeves uh, and stand there and say, I'm going to preach to you from the precious Word of God. Uh, and brother, he'd feed us uh, and he'd, he'd preach myself, the Lord. Uh, I never will forget when I went to see him, he's just dying or close to his deathbed. I went in the convalescent home. Brother Carlton was with me and I said, Carlton, watch this. A little nurse standing over said, Mr. Jackson, he doesn't know his wife. He doesn't to know his own daughter, and he will not know you. I said, that may be so, but I want to speak to him. I want to thank him for preaching the Word of God to me. Now I walked over there. Here he was, 95, going on 96. His hair white as snow. He lost a lot of weight lying there in the bed. I walked up to him, and I said, Brother Phillips! He said, Brother Mays. I said, did you know me? He lifted up his eyes and said, No, I don't know you. I said, Yeah, you do. Think now. Think. You know me. He said, No, I don't know you. I looked at him real closely. I said, think. He said, no, I don't know you. And the nurse said, I told you he doesn't know anybody. I said, watch this. I said, Brother Phillips, are you still preaching? And he looked up at me and said, twice every Sunday. <laughs> well, you say, Brother May, let me tell you something. Bless God, if you've ever preached, you may forget your wife's name. You may forget your preacher boy. But there's one thing about it. You'll never forget Mountain that pulpit and tell him the word of God. God and preach in the Word of God. You'll never forget it. That little nurse standing there, she said, well, he did know. I said, bless God, that's not all he knows. Watch this. I said, Brother Phillips. I said, call him, come up here close. Call him, said, boy, that's good. I said, Brother Phillips, do you know the Holy Ghost? And he liked to jump from my left bed. He clapped his hands and said, sure, I know the sweet Holy Ghost. I said, glory to God, if you've ever had the Holy Ghost to put his arms around you. And if you've ever had the Spirit of God to comfort your lonely heart, you may forget a lot in this world. But you'll never forget the sweetness of the Holy Ghost. I want to say to you on this Sunday afternoon, brother, that old man was a gospel preacher. That old man preached the Word of God. And we need some gospel preaching. In America, Mr. As sure as your name's what it is, we need to hear the saith the Lord. We need some preaching like I had in Nineveh. When old Jonah came in there, wiping seaweeds out of his eyes and out of his hair, preaching hell in 40 days, and I had a fish ride, and I want to tell you something. God wants you to repent, or there's judgment falling on this land. We need some preaching like John the Baptist did when he came out of the wilderness, wiping honey out of his mouth and sugar king out of his hair and cried. Repenting for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We need some preaching like.
like Paul when he stood on Mars Hill and said one time, God winked at your ignorance, but now had commanded all men to repent. And they said he's a madman. By the way, he preaching in this day in which we live. But there's going to be a famine of Bible preaching. I'm so glad, praise the Lord, I got in with this Bible preaching crowd. And Bible preaching crowd. And somebody said to her, I want you to know, my friend, it's good to come and eat to the Word of God. Oh, it's wonderful. Years ago, I was in Jamaica. Now, I like to preach in Jamaica years ago. They didn't have, well, not because they didn't have a place to sit down. No, we didn't have seats for them. And they'd come and stand here and hear me preach. Uh, and I'd cry and shout. And they couldn't understand me, but they felt something. Glory to God. And I'd preach. Uh, and brother, we'd have a turn. Uh, I remember one time after I'd preached, an old man that was diseased, about 80 years old, in overhauls, uh, crawled down those, uh, the, down the aisle, down through that, that old, that old sand, and that old clay down there in Jamaica. Rock looked at me and said, Brother Nays, uh, I appreciate you preaching the word to me. He said, you came a long way just to preach to me. He said, would you tell me some more? And I said, you sat down there, bless God. And he sat down in his overhauls on that old, that old cold, or that, old, that old sand. And he was listening while I took a text and preached to him, Jesus. And while I preached to him the word of God, I want you to know, mister, nothing can take the place of the preaching of the word of God. And we've substituted every giving and we've substituted everything on the Son, but nothing can take the place of the saith the Lord and the preaching of the Word of God. Oh, what a blessing it is to know that you got a preacher that preaches the Bible. Number one, there'll be a Bible, or there'll be a famine of Bible preaching. Number two, there'll be a, a famine a Bible concern. There was a time people was concerned about their neighbor. But bless God, you can die now, and then your neighbor will never know it till they read in a high point enterprise the next day. You say, preacher, me, there's not much love. You know what I told this church this morning? One of the accusations I brought in front of them, they don't have that love they used to have. Now, brother, you can have all kinds, all kinds of beautiful lights. You can have all kinds of carpet on the floor. You can have all kinds of singing but if you walk in the house of God and there's not that love flowing from breast to breast, if there's not that unity in the Holy Ghost and love, brother, you miss it. I like to go around the church where people say, you know, I love you. I appreciate you. Praise God. And you say, why, brother, me, he's that childish, but he sure is good. Amen. Yes, sir. But there's going to be a famine of Bible compassion and Bible concern. Uh, there are not many folks that have a compassion anymore. They closed up their bowels of compassion. Uh, there are not many people, bless your heart, uh, that really have a concern uh, over the dying and a concern over the lost anymore. Not even over sick folks anymore. I used to talk about a man in the community. He is sick and everybody take a day off and go and then plow his corn. They'd take care of his crop. They'd be there when they, he needed them. There's always that Bible concern. But today it's just like that priest and Levite. They pass by on the other side and know not the need of that poor old wounded and dying man. But thank God, after a while, the good Samaritan yeah. came by. And you say, preacher, what did he do? Well, he took a little time. And he looked and had compassion. And went over to the knelt down and anointed him. And, and poured all in the spoons. And the Word of God says, bound him up, uh, put him on his beast, and took him up to the end, uh, and said, I've taken care of him, uh, and if there's anything he owes, uh, when I come back again, uh, let me know, and I'll take care of that. Uh, now, you may not, as I said last night, you might not agree with what I said. I preached on some bits of heaven, and some men that had some, just a little taste of heaven here. But let me tell you something. You did something you didn't agree about what I said about Paul. That doesn't make any difference. I... Now, we, we'll, not, we'll not fall out about that. Some of you didn't believe it died. I believe it died went to heaven. But you don't have to believe that. Some of you won't believe this. I, I don't believe that poor man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho started down and fell among thieves. Uh, ever saw the Good Samaritan. I believe he is half dead. And the uh, Good Samaritan, I believe, took him to the inn, uh, laid him down and said, I paid the price. Uh, and if there's anything he owes when I come again, I'll eat two pence. Uh, and if there's anything else, a pence stands for a thousand years. Uh, said, I'm going to pay him up for two thousand years. Uh, and if there's anything owing when I get back, uh, I'll take care of that. Uh, and he went his way. And I believe that old boy got better. And he'd get up every day. Now, this is what I believe. You don't have to believe it. I believe he'd go outside and look down there 
And you know what he'd see? He'd see nothing. And then he'd look up that way and see nothing. And the innkeeper said, Hey, mister, who are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for the one that came and picked me up. And I'm looking for the good Samaritan. Oh, you said he's coming back. And I, I didn't see him, but you said he's coming. And I believe he's coming. I didn't see him. But thank God, 1900 years ago he came. He died. He was buried. He got up on the third day. Forty days later he ascended. And you say, why are you looking down the room for? I'm looking for the one that picked me up and had compassion and concern and some Gold of daybreak, he's coming. Thank God. Oh, listen, apathy, indifference, coldness, and unconcern. There's a famine of real compassion. Let me give you two scriptures, and then I'll have to go to the next thing. Listen to me. Psalmist said, I looked on my right. I looked on my left, no man cared for my soul. Isn't that an indictment against you and me? That somebody might say, no man cared for my soul. Now, one other scripture. And old Jeremiah walked over and he said, there's Jerusalem. There's Jerusalem. And the people are walking by as if nothing had happened. And old Jeremiah got in the ditch and he was weeping as they passed by. He said, look at the temple, it's torn down. Look at the houses, they've been burned to the ground. Look at the women out there working like men. Look at the the children that are hungry. And he said, is it nothing to you as you pass by? Oh, and said, what's wrong with you? Is it nothing? There'll be a famine of Bible, Bible faith when Jesus comes. Listen what Jesus said. Will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? Now, brother, they're not much old-fashioned. I'm talking about Bible faith. Somebody said, what is faith? Oh, I know you've quoted over that. It's substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Now, I'll tell you what real Bible faith is. Saying God said it, I believe it. And praise God, I'm going to stand on it. Amen. That's Bible faith. But there'll be a famine of Bible faith in the coming of the Lord. You can't get full to believe God anymore. One of the best friends I have was here the other night. Of course, some of you don't remember it. Some of you do. You know he's my friend. But he put me in the office valley I've ever been in. He had me believing the whole whole heaven was going to fall in before daylight. And he had me. He said, he said, you go cancel all them stations. He said, me. He said, things over. He said, oh, son, it's all gone. I said, it may be. But I'm going to shout as long as I can shout and holler as long as I can holler. But oh, you say, preacher, my faith is not in Ford or Nixon or any of the rest of them. My faith is in the Lamb of God. Praise God. He owns it all. And brother, we need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your faith in the denomination? Is your faith in the independence? Is your faith, bless God, in people? Or can you say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I know this afternoon there'll be a famine of people that believe God. It'll be as it was Jesus said when God said, all right, if I find 50 people, I'll spare it. And then he said 45 people. And then he said 30 people, 40 people, 30 people, 20 people, 10 people. And because he said, I found not, not 10 righteous people, he destroyed the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Faith! Where is it? We need faith like Paul had after 14 days. When neither the sun or the moon shine. Bless God, he stepped out on that old boat and said, Be of good cheer, for I believe God. I'm standing on the promises. And brother, you'd better get you some promises. And stand on the promises of God. I want you to know if heaven and earth shall pass away. But this is something that will never pass away. And the promises of God's word will never pass away. I'm glad I'm not trusting in the promises of man. But I'm standing on the word of God. But in the third place there will be a, a famine of Bible faith. Number four, there will be a famine of Bible holiness. Now I want you to let this really bog in. I'm not talking about wholeness. I'm talking about about Bible holiness. I'm talking about living something. Anybody can jump up and holler what they'd have. But I want to know how you treat your wife when you get home. Say amen right there. Some of you come down here just lovey dovey dovey and slam the door in her face and holler at her. And you do, oh my! And you put on, <laughs> that's so nice, nice. I can see Claude over there in his eye right now. But that's so! 
That's so. You know it's so. And some of you come down here and oh, you're so, you say, oh, I believe in Bible holiness. But you don't live like it when you deal with people. Like, oh, when you're, when you're a treating you don't really listen. You don't love it. I'm not talking about this charismatic crowd that's got so many people confused as pitiful either. I'm not talking about these off brands. I'm talking about people that'll pick their Bible up and say, I'm living in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, where Paul said to the church, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now that that's Bible holiness, it's what you live every day. Amen. It's how you live. You ought to draw nigh to God. You ought to die out to self and be crucified to self. But you don't find many folks want to live a Bible holy way. They want to live their own way. Well, you're not finding more, but many folks in this day and time. Did you know it? Bless so hard that wants God and nothing but God. Oh, you don't find many folks that'll say, Preacher Mays, I want my life to be separated and dedicated and holy to God. Here sits my son in this service this afternoon. And some of you are sitting by your family. But I want my life to count before him. I want him to say, my daddy is a holy preacher. My daddy is a holy man. He believes in living a holy life. And brother, there'll be a famine, listen, of holy living. Let me come to the fifth thing. There'll be a famine of Bible preaching. And it's just about here. You go in some churches and you never hear an amen. You go in some churches, brother, and I'll tell you there's, there's no praise at all. You know what? What I believe by Bible preaching. I believe that you ought to praise the Lord because of who He is. <laughs> I praise Him because He is God. I praise Him, my friend, because He's God. And that's why I praise Him. I don't praise Him because He gives me a new shirt. Oh, He said He'd do that. I don't praise Him because He gives me a new suit. I praise Him because He's from everlasting to everlasting God. I praise Him because He walks the dark hills. I praise Him because He is. And hallelujah, we need some Bible praise in this day of God. You say, but you know, it's not popular anymore. It wasn't popular when David, you know, came out back and his dancing for the ark and he had a wife. Isn't she pitiful? And she stuck her head out the window and said, Stop that shouting! Stop that shouting! But I'll tell you a real shout, you won't stop it, bless God. And the whole David just danced on and praised the Lord. Why, it's the most blessed thing in the world to be able to praise Him. To stand up and say, I want to praise the Lord for what He is and who He is. I want to praise Him. Bible praise shall be a famine of it. And I've always said this, when you got a pole barn, a pool pit, you'll have icicles on the pew. Say amen right Bless God, if you serve ice cream, your members will be just as cold as that cream. <laughs> amen. You say amen. You know, and you say, we serve soup, and they'll be as weak as that soup, too. Amen. And sir, God help us in this day in which we're living in. we got to get every kind of little gimmick to get them to church. And I want to tell you something. It don't make a difference what kind of gimmick you get. Whether it's a joke-telling preacher, or a quartet, or bless God, it's a pint of ice cream. If it's a gimmick to get them there, it's still a gimmick. Say amen right there. Amen. So let's gag about some of these things and other things. Listen, it ought to be that if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. And brother, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, needs to be lifted. And if He won't draw, we in the wrong business. I believe the Son of God still has power to draw me in. And you know it. You know I'm telling the truth. Now, I never do something. Well, brother, make your critical. No, that's what you want to do all right. That's what you want to do all right, preacher. That's what you want to do all right. But I want to tell you what I want to do. I want to lift up Jesus. Yeah. And oh, listen, I want to preach it straight. Yeah. Somebody said, yeah, but they'll get mad. That's all right. <laughs> Praise God. I'm going to preach it straight. And you that here this morning, I preached on a backbone and preached on Daniel and his convictions. You know that we lost our convictions in the churches of America. And we don't have have any convictions anymore. We'll let any old multi headed quartet get up and sing, bless God, and some of these little mini-skirted women get up and sing in our churches. Say amen. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. Every, listen, we ought never to bar anybody coming here the gospel. Now, I don't fall out with the people that come in here, but we've had folks come in this week that their dresses are too short, but they're not right with God. they got a right to come in. 
Of course, you ought to have enough respect to come to God's house, put their dresses down, say amen, whether you're saved or not. And we've had some men around here. You couldn't tell whether they're women or men, but I'll tell you, it's all right for them to come. I'm not, but I want to tell you, when we get folks to stand on this platform, they ought to look right, smell right, act right, walk right, and talk right. Amen. That's, That's the way it ought to be. We ought to have some folks that are really dedicated to Jesus Christ. Amen. And where I fall out with these fellows who have having those folks, they're not living right to say. Those folks are not living right to get up here. Those folks are not living right to teach a Sunday school class. I went to church not far from here, and I was amazed. One something I saw this week, boy, I, I tell you, it stirred me. I'm talking about a fundamental. Bible believe it. <laughs> Separated church. And somebody said, Do you mean they're, they're some of the worst kind? If you didn't know it, say amen right there. That's God. Say amen. Y'all dying on me right now, but that's so. <laughs> That's right, you say, preacher me. That's right, we got some more. Well, I tell you, well, I want to tell you right now, I don't care what you are. We ought to have people living holy lives and having a church that's dedicated to God. And then, brother, when you praise the Lord, it'll make somebody else know that there's a God in heaven. My Bible says when they shouted in First Samuel chapter 4, the ground rang out. Hallelujah, you like that? It said the ground rang out and the Philistines knew that God was with them. And the Philistines said, How great and dreadful is their God. He's the one that delivered them. You say, when they shouted in the Holy Ghost, and when they gave praise to their God. And I believe, brother, it's time to give praise to God. It's time that we praise the Lord. I was in Pittsburgh one time. Some of the good folks up there hear the broadcast will get this, and they'll remember it. I was preaching, this, I was preaching the largest Baptist church up there. We was having a time. And they had three big chairs. And the pastor had come out. And he wore robes. And the associate pastor came out. He wore robes. And then the choir leader came out. And he wore robes. And then the choir came out. And all them had robes on. Now, I used to didn't believe in robes. <laughs> but I'll tell you now, you go to Average Baptist Church and you'll believe in robes. Say amen right in the choir. That's right. It's indecent. Well, I used to be, brother. If you was going down here and see a volleyball act, you'd go down here to Carnival. Now, you can come to a lot of these Baptist churches and bless God. Look at the choir in there. Amen. Say amen. Y'all yeah. so. Don't look at me like I'm preaching strange doctrine. I'm preaching the truth to you. And, brother, it's so whether we believe it or not. I want to tell you, I was preaching up there, and I got to feeling good. I, I, listen, I was about 11, 11 steps up. And I was uh, preaching up there in Sandusky. I was having me a time, and I looked down, and I said, Glory to God, I'm going to walk in Jerusalem just like John. <laughs> and about that time, an old lady back there from over at Monroeville, Pennsylvania, jumped up and said, And I'm going to walk with you. Hallelujah. <laughs> and she started shouting and praising God. And the pastor behind me said, Sit her down. <laughs> and I just kept seeking her own, brother. I said, Hallelujah. We'll walk in Jerusalem just like John. And brother, the Holy Ghost is about to, oh, bless me and her to death. It's, it's, some of us dying for the death. But me and her, and I knew she is real. It wasn't any put on with her. And she's a praising God. And the preacher said, sit her down. And I said, I didn't stand her up. And I ain't going to sit her down. Bless God. I want to tell you something to praise. Oh, Bible praise. What a wonderful thing it is to praise our God for who He is. But then number six, there'll be a, a famine of Bible conviction. Now, how long has it been since you've been in a revival and you saw real conviction? Now, I don't mean where preachers have to drag men down the aisle and wring a confession out of them. That's not worth a nickel. Now, unless he draws the Holy Ghost. Listen. Now, and unless the Holy Ghost corners you now, with great conviction, brother, listen. Now, there will be no lasting reserves. Somebody said, why can't you find a convert after revival? I'll tell you why. Because it was the dancers that got them up, or it's the singers that got them up, and it wasn't the Holy Ghost. If you ever get hemmed up, and the Holy Ghost ever crowds you in the corner and puts a handcuffs of love on you and brings you down that aisle and you throw up the white flag and repent of your sin, they won't have to hunt you next Sunday, and next Sunday you'll be in the house of God, and brother, you'll be there in the place where God wants you to be. But we're living in a day and a time where there's not much Holy Ghost conviction. I was preaching the other morning. Boy, it was good. I like it, boy. I was a white so lady said to me one night, I said, Preacher, what is that runs out the corner of your mouth while you're preaching? I said, Sister, that's honey from Canaan's land. <laughs> Woo! Bless God. I want you to know it's not brute and say amen right there. That's honey from Canaan's land. And I was a preaching the other morning in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. And while I, oh, listen, 
I'm telling you, I never saw anything like it. Had people weeping all around, and I was there crying. And a man about 50 something years old had his, I guess, 20 year old daughter, and his precious wife sitting next to him, and some other children sitting there, and maybe just visitors with him. And brother, while I was there preaching, they started crying. But I never heard a man do this while I was preaching a long time. 50, I believe his brother Don told me he's about 60 years old. And he kept saying, Oh, Lord. Boy, I said, get him good. Holy Ghost, get him good. <laughs> Woo! Some of you say, that scared me. Boy, I was so glad to hear that. And he kept saying, Lord. Oh, God. And I said, Lord, I haven't heard that in so long. And you know he's want me to quit preaching. Now, a lot of you want me to quit so you can go home. He's want me to quit so he can get to God. That's what he wants. Brother, I was the longest winded preacher he'd ever heard. He's a holler and want me to quit so he can get down there. And I said, I'll soak him good before I let him come. Bless God. And I just kept right on a preaching and right on a crying and kept on a shouting. And when I turned and I turned and said, Brother Willis, what are you going to sing? He said, We're going to sing. Brother Mace, just as I am with that one, please. And I turned around. You know where that fellow was? He's right down there. Lord, save me right now. I can't stand it any longer. And I said, Lord, do it quick. Hallelujah. I want to get in on the blessings. And brother, when God touched him, brother, he touched my soul. And heaven was moving there. Somebody said, why? Because there was real Holy Ghost connection. And brother, listen. You're seeing a lot of people come make decisions. You're seeing folks shaking oh. preachers hands. You're seeing folks come for baptism. But how long has it been since men couldn't wait uh, under conviction for the preacher to stop preaching so they could get in the altar and repent of their sins and get right with God. Oh, mister, oh, for that conviction, a uh, Sinai conviction when Zion travails sons and daughters are born. Yeah. Oh, when the church carries that burden, there will be souls born into the kingdom of God. Now I want to tell you something. They'll do like that Philippian jailer. They'll cry, what must I do to be saved? Let me give you the last thing and I'll have to close. Watch this. There'll be a famine of bread. There'll be people eating out of garbage cans. It says a measure for a penny. Just, this li just a teeny, just a teeny little bit. Just a few little, uh, just a little wheat, just a little bit, uh, and it'll cost you a penny. If you put all it together and made a loaf of bread, it'll cost you twenty dollars. Uh, you say, Brother Mace, does God let us know when a famine's coming? Watch this. And Pharaoh went to bed. Genesis chapter 41. And he got up and he said, I dreamed a dream. I got to know what that dream means. And he called the magicians. And he called in his uh, inflationary board. Like Mr. Ford. And said, let's get all this crowd together and see if we can figure it out. And they said, man, there's a man here named Joseph that moved out in Derby Dreams. And he called old Joseph in there. And he said, I'll tell you what happened, sir. He said, in your dream you saw seven fat cows come up out of that river. And after those seven fat cows came up out of that river, you saw seven lean cows come up out of that river, and the seven lean cows ate the seven fat cows. And he said, you saw some else. You saw a stalk of corn, and you saw seven big ears on that stalk. And then he, he said, you saw a stalk nearby, and it had seven lean ears. And the seven lean ears reached over and got a hold of the seven fat ears and ate them. And he said, Pharaoh, you better get ready for the famine. He said, there'll be seven years of plenty. Get your houses and your pantries. And oh, he said, get your granaries. And he said, oh, get your white houses filled. Because after seven years, there's going to be a famine of bread. Now listen, I want to show you something. Now you talk about this, it's going to be awful around High Point. Because I believe that when this really happens, I'll be gone. I'll be at the rapture. I don't know. Some of it may get bad even before the rapture. But I know before I... Over here it says a measure. I know I'll be gone before that. But watch this. Did you know if you come to the city where I live, and I take you down the street today, listen to me. It's dangerous for you to walk or ride in your car with the windows up down in certain parts of Atlanta, Georgia. They'll break the windows out. They'll steal the tires off of your car. They'll murder you for a quarter. To get a piece of bread! 
but you wait in High Point and Atlanta, Georgia, and other places until, brother, there's nothing in the cupboards. And a loaf of bread will cost $20. There's no jobs. And men will be hungry. Oh, you say, preacher, what's going to happen? It'll be unsafe for you to stay in your own home. The Bible says inflation's coming. The Bible says starvation's coming. The Bible said a famine's coming. But wait a minute. It says and the righteous in his seed will not have to go back in bread. <laughs> Woo! Thank God he said, I believe I'll go home. The Father's got bread enough to spare, and I'm over here in a perishing country. That old particle said, I'm going to get up, and I'm going home. If you're here on this Sunday afternoon, or if you're listening to this record, oh, listen, you can get up. Hunger in your soul. And I'm glad you can come to the Father's house. He's got a table with a bread on it. He's got a table that's bread and your hungry soul can be fed if you'll get up and say I believe I'll go home thank God there's bread enough to spare every head bowed if I closed all of the house while your heads are bowed while your eyes are closed thank you for listening to the message the Bible said a measure of wheat as little containers they could get for that measure as little containers they could get is that third measure in the Bible that's what John is talking about. He said the smallest little cup, smallest little thimble, smallest little container you can find. Put just a few drops of wheat in it. And that's a measure. Now there are three types of measures. And the smallest one is what he's talking about. And it'll cost you a penny, just a few, just a little bit of grain. Just a teeny touch of grain. And he said in that day... There'll be one with a pair of balances in his hand. And the horse will ride out when the third seal is broken. And there'll be hunger stalking the land. I want to ask you something, my friend. Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you know God? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Father, I thank you for this rally service. Thank you for the message of the Lord. Thank you that we have the truth of God in these days in which we live. But, oh, God, may we take the bread that we have and May we share it with the hungry that need the Word of God, the precious Bible. Oh God, may we recognize that the night is already gathering. The clouds are already forming. And oh God, may we see that what we do, we must do it in a hurry. Help us, Lord. Take this offering. Lord, these precious people have given in memory of their loved ones. Sanctify it. And oh God, I pray in Jesus' name, we have chunder somewhere. May some hungry soul hear. May some hungry soul eat. Because we've given of the bread that God's blessed us with this day. Sanctify this record. Bless it, Lord. May hungry-hearted men and women hear it. And may men and women get right with God. May there be Holy Ghost conviction on this record. And may men and women fall down upon their knees and say, Listen, then, Lord, in just a moment when Brother Richard leads us in the song, I pray... That everyone in this house, everyone in this house will examine themselves to be sure that he is right with God. Oh, Lord, may everyone be right. Everyone be right. Before they leave here, may they know they're right with God in Jesus' name.